tonight. If you'd stand with me, take your songbooks, turn to page 129. We'll sing Rock of Ages. Page 129. Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flow. On the last, while I draw this fleeting breath, when my eyes shall close in death, when I rise to worlds unknown, and behold thee on thy throne, rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Amen. You may be seated. Jesus, he died. 
died for me For all the world to hear I'll say it loud and clear That's my God That's my God Amen. Well, praise the Lord for that special. I love that declaration tonight. And the world needs to hear that. He is our God. So praise the Lord for that special open up the service tonight. We do want to welcome you to the Sunday evening service right here at the Lighthouse Baptist Church. The Lord has given us just a wonderful day again to worship Him and serve Him. We had a great service this morning. We're looking forward to get it, doing it all over again tonight. So we do want to welcome you and thank you for being here. We do want you to ask you to continue to pray for Pastor and Mrs. Tidd while they're away, that the Lord continue to strengthen them and use them. But again, we're so grateful that you're here tonight. If you're visiting with us for the first time, we'd like to be able to get a visitor's packet in your hands. And the ushers have those in the front. So I'm going to ask them as they stand and as they make their way down the aisle, if you're visiting with us or if you'd just like to have a visitor's packet, if you'd raise your hand and get their attention, they'll be able to get one of those to you this evening. And of course, it's good seeing those being faithful to the Lord's house on this Sunday evening. And again, we're grateful for all the Lord has continued to do in this place. Um, and isn't it a blessing? Today is the last Sunday in the month of January. Praise the Lord for that. It means we're moving on. We're one step closer to spring. And we're grateful again for a beautiful day the Lord has given to us. Of course, on Sunday evenings, we like to take a time to give testimony as a praise. And we don't always have those, but perhaps there's something that the Lord has done in your life uh, recently that you want to share with the church. The ushers have microphones in the back, and so all you need to do is raise your hand, and they'll bring one of those around to you, and you can speak into that. So I'll give you that opportunity. Anybody like that? Uh, yes, Mary in the back. I just want to thank our church uh, for all the prayers. Ed is doing much better. Amen. Um, you can tell prayers work, <laughs> and Amen. he appreciates them, and we just want to say thank you. Amen. Praise the Lord. And, of course, Ed was in the hospital with pneumonia there for a little while, and he's home. He's still on oxygen, so you'll be praying for him as he's continuing to recover. But it's good to see Mary back this evening, and we certainly have been praying for them, so we're grateful for God's grace and uh, mercy there and uh, just raising him up. So pre please continue to pray for that. All right. Somebody else have a testimony of praise tonight? Don't want to miss anybody this evening. All right. Very good. Let me just go over just a couple of quick announcements for you. Of course, if you did not receive a bulletin when you came in, I'll make sure you take one with you, and that'll keep you up to date with all that's going on. And again, I point your direction to the monitors in the front before and after all the services. We'll have the um, announcements on a loop there. Uh, but there are a couple of things this week that you'll want to be aware of. Um, Friday, we'll have a seniors luncheon and meeting that'll meet here at noon, and they'll meet in the gymnasium, and they'll have a nice lunch there. And then a time of Bible study after that. And so if you're a senior, or as Pastor often says, a senior wannabe, you're welcome at this meeting. And so you can come on out Friday at noon. Uh, Brother Buddy oversees that. And I was just thinking, everybody's a senior wannabe, right? Nobody's a senior here. We're just senior wannabes. And I go in and I enjoy the food that's there. So I'm going to uh, join with you there. Uh, but that'll be at noon on Friday. And Brother Buddy oversees that ministry. And then, of course, the Central Indiana Youth Rally is Friday evening at 7 um, and, of course, I think they'll be leaving here a little bit earlier than that. So if you have any questions, you can see Brother Travis or any of the youth staff, and they can take care of that. All right. And then, of course, all the other announcements can be found there in the bulletin. We're going to have our offering here in just a minute. But before we do that, I want to recognize a few that have just con uh, completed discipleship. And I know Andrew Duff is here tonight. I don't think Mackenzie is here. But I'll have Andrew come up this evening and receive his discipleship certificate. Go ahead and give him a hand if you would. And uh, he just, we just completed this just before the service began tonight, and uh, it's been a long time. We've been working on that, but schedules have, have uh, caused us to interrupt here and there. But uh, let me encourage you, if you have not gone through our discipleship program, to get involved in that. It's a great blessing, and we'll pair you up with someone. Right now we have currently several that are going through that, and uh, some that uh, are getting completed, some that are getting ready to start that. Uh, but we'll get you going in that. It's a 14-week discipleship program. And it goes over to a lot of the key Bible doctrines and uh, just gives you a great resource when you're finished with discipleship, a full, almost a textbook that's full of scripture on several different subjects that you can use and help other people after that. And so I'd encourage you, if you have any desire to go through that, to speak to myself or any of our staff and we can take you through that, all right? At this time, we'll go ahead and have our evening offering. Ushers, come forward, please. Looking in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9, it says, Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the firstfruits of all thine increase. Let's pray. 
Lord, we thank you for this time that you've given us tonight. We thank you for this day. Thank you for the freedom we have to come to a church and worship you freely without fear of a repercussion. Pray that you would help us all to be open to whatever you preach to us tonight through Brother Buddy. Pray that we would all apply it to our lives as we go out through the rest of this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'll stand together again, 178, now in your songbooks, Jesus Loves Even Me, page 178. I am so glad that our Father in heaven tells of his love in the book he has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see, this is the dearest that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me. loves even me. Though I forget him and wander away, still he doth love me wherever I stray. Back to his dear loving arms I would flee when I remember that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. On the last, oh, if there's only one song I can sing, when in his beauty I see the great King, then shall my song in eternity be. Oh, what a wonder that Jesus, sing it out. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Great singing. You may be seated. A thousand times I've heard it as a shout of praise. Three little words sung with joy from a heart that's so amazed but every now and then i hear it from a broken heart of faith spoken with a whisper as tears are wiped away and it steals my breath to hear them say god is good Fear is what they feel. They testify. 
testify to a faith that's settled and it's real. Cause when calm turns into chaos, peace is stronger than the pain. When you know that you are held by a God who doesn't change, and the simple truth is still. Amen. Praise the Lord for the message in that song tonight. You can evaluate every aspect of your life, every uh, appliance you may have, every item you may use, every food that you've eaten, and none of those things are always good. (laughs) You're going to run into problems every once in a while in life, but we have assurance, we have the Word of God, we have our life experience to remind us that God is always good. I'm so thankful for that, and we can rejoice in that. No matter what comes our way in life, God doesn't change. And his goodness is always there. We're going to be in the book of Joel tonight, chapter 2. This morning we looked at the love of God and the motivation we have because of his love to, first of all, accept it and then live for the one who loved us. And tonight... This message is for the Christian that whose life may not be where they wish it was or where it's been at one point and their relationship with the Lord is, has, is, has dwindled or is not what it needs to be. And I hope this is an encouragement to you here tonight. Joel chapter 2, we're going to begin reading in verse 12. It says, Therefore also now saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. And rend your heart and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, spare the people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, where is their God? Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. He, the Lord, will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith, and I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. But I will remove far off from you the northern army, and will drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face toward the east sea and his hinder part toward the utmost sea. And his stink shall come up and his ill savor shall come up because he hath done great things. Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, you beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring. For the tree beareth her fruit, and the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, 
And he will cause to come down you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. And the floor shall be full of weed, and the vat shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. Restoration is possible. Lord, we love you, God. We thank you for the day you've given us. Lord, the privilege that it is to be in your word. God, I pray that you would, would open our hearts and minds to your word tonight. God, I pray that it would be with me, first of all, as I deliver your word. I pray that you would... God, give me your words to say. Fill me with your spirit. Use me. God, I pray you should be with everyone that's here in the pew tonight, God, that they would, uh, Lord, just be ready to hear and receive tonight. God, I pray that, Lord, when the service is over, God, we'd all have a desire to, Lord, make sure our life, our relationship with you is where it needs to be. And if it's not, I pray, God, that we're willing to make changes and to give discipline due, Lord, to have the relationship with you and have your blessings and all the things you have for us in that close relationship. Be this we ask in your name. Amen. Several years ago, there was this home improvement TV show that hit the country by storm. My wife and I were, were big fans of it. I know many here were as well. And we, would, we traveled down two different times to the state of Texas to see family, but we also went with the intention of stopping by a city named Waco, Texas to visit this place called Magnolia. This couple, the, the Gaines, they would find people where people would come to them with these old, ugly, sometimes abandoned homes, and they would work with them for with sometimes with a certain budget. And after months of work, they would bring them out, and they'd have this big picture in front of the house, and they'd have this big reveal, and they would say, are you ready to see your fixer-upper? And we were just... Uh, taken by the show, and we're always waiting to see these, these final results. And it was amazing to watch any home they would touch would go from something ugly, something unwanted, something unusable, many times to something great. And by that, we've come to this realization, we've seen all these uh, different things, even here in Indianapolis, the ugly bones, and we've seen these other companies that have gone and they specialize in restoring, is it ugly bones, is that what it's called? Oh, see, I don't even know. <laughs> I've never watched it. Never watched it. <laughs> but we've seen, as we look at these old, nasty homes, we see these abandoned places. Now we see them with different eyes because we have an understanding that those homes, those bones of the house are not beyond restoration. We look at the children of Israel here, and there's a lot of destruction. There's famine, but God is speaking to them here in chapter 2 of the book of Joel, and he is, he is telling them that they have an opportunity to have their fellowship, their relationship with him restored. But as we find them here in Joel chapter 2, we see that they are very much in trouble. The land is ruined. The people are discouraged. The prophet Joel is using these events as an illustration of God's judgment on Israel. Their specific sin is not named in this book, but as we see in these verses, we understand the people had slipped into a state of complacency and apathy about the things of God. You know, God used nature and he used Israel's enemies as a means of his, his judgment. He's using these trials they face to wake them up and to call them back to him. The book of Joel is a book of judgment, but as we read this, we understand it's also a book of hope. It was written to the people of Israel. It deals with their past. It deals with their future. It looks back on the judgment of God for their sin. But it also looks forward to a glorious day where their relationship and their blessings of the Lord will all be restored back to them. We could pause for a moment tonight and we could look at the state of our world. We could look at the state of our country. And I think we can look at our country and wonder, is there any hope for the future? 
We wonder if there's any hope for revival. We wonder what kind of promise that there is for us in the dark days that we live in. You may be here tonight and you may just be examining your own heart, wondering, struggling, trying to understand why you feel so far away from God and you've tried to pick up your Bible, you've tried to develop that relationship back and you, you feel that your relationship with God may be beyond repair. You've been searching, you've been hoping, but you can't seem to find your way out. And I want to encourage you tonight, these verses teach us there's hope. Restoration is possible. We could start here at the beginning of the book of Joel and we would see the sad condition of the people of Israel. We could look back in chapter 1, verse 4, and we could find that there's famine. Insects have, have come in and invasion after invasion has destroyed and, and ruined the crops. There's no food left for the people. We could continue on there, beginning of verse 8, and we would see a severe drought had come and afflicted the land. There was no rain, and because of there's no rain, the crops failed. And because there was no crops, the herds, the wild animals, they'd all either died off or they'd wandered off trying to find some food or some land that could be a pasture for them. The water's all dried up. Fires have come out. They've broke out and destroyed the forest. And because of that, the children of Israel really are defeated. They also faced, they also faced an invasion from surrounding nations. And the armies that came in destroyed their vineyards, destroyed their orchards. Their enemies were strong, numerous, and seemed too powerful for them to stop. And it seemed to them, and it was inevitable, that they would eventually be starved out and or utterly destroyed by their enemies. So why was this happening to them? Why did all this stuff come to their lives? Why were they losing their food? Why were they, why were they being threatened and defeated by their enemies? God was judging them. When you look here in chapter 1, verse 14, it says, Sanctify ye a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God, and cry unto the Lord. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. You know, none of these things were accidental. They were the judgment of God on them. The people had turned against God, and they were paying for their rebellion. Joel called the troubles that they were facing the day of the Lord. Everything they were dealing with was a product of their rebellion and God's judgment. God is judging our nation. You know, we think about the sin and the evil that is rampant in the day and age that we live in. And we're living in a generation that, as the Bible says in the book of Isaiah, calls evil good and good evil. We have a society, a, many people that protect the wicked and they punish the righteous. We're living in a world where fear has, has replaced faith. Where sin has replaced sanity. Agendas being pushed that are far against the word of God. There's hatred. There's intolerance to the word of God and the truths of the Bible. Trying everything they can to change it or to uh, get people to denounce it or to try to say that only part of it is credible. I believe our nation is under the judgment of the Lord, and I believe that's why it's in the shape that it is today. That's why so many churches that were once strong and once standing for God are in a spiritual drought. Probably can look at the younger generations coming up, and we see so many that have little desire for the Lord, even in the, even in the good churches of the day. Many Christians have become cold and lifeless. You know, God will judge the complacent Christian. Many would rather play than pray. Many would rather be entertained than challenged by the word of God. Many would rather stay like they are than become more like God. You know, if, if we're not careful, it's, it's easy for us to just go through the motions and allow our relationship in our heart for the Lord to dwindle and not be what it needs to be. And I want to tell you tonight, I want to warn you tonight that complacency to the things of God will bring a spiritual famine to your life. It will cause you to 
to feel far from God. It'll cause you to miss out on the voice of God speaking to you. It'll cause you to operate, to go through your life without the wisdom of God. It'll lead to emptiness. Is anyone there tonight? I've been there in my life. I think of many times in my life where I've, I've just gone through the motions and I've tried to just do my job or, or do what I was supposed to do as a, as a young man. And I've, I've gone through these, those things. I've been to church. When it came to my relationship with God, when it came to being part of the service and, and getting what God had for me to get in those things, I was just there. I've seen it in people I love. That's a scary place to be. It's a dangerous place to be. It's a dangerous place to be because complacency will not only bring spiritual doubt, but it will eventually lead to victory by the enemy. How many battles are you losing by the, against the devil? How many temptations are in your life that may seem out of control? How many, how many of our, our hearts or our thought process, our, our thought life is not what it needs to be? There may be people tonight here that are really having trouble in the home and the home is full of anger, the home is full of bitterness, the home is full of lies and deceit or uh, things not being brought up as they should, hidden sins, a lack of unity. I want to warn you against complacency because if, if we live a, a life of complacency and we allow the enemy to come in and have victory, eventually God will judge. We spoke a while about sin this morning. I'm not going to repeat all these things I said, but the Bible has told us, be sure your sin will find you out. And maybe there is someone here tonight that is under the judgment of God. There may be a trial or a difficult time going on in someone's life. And sometimes God allows trials to come into our life to grow us or to, to, to strengthen our relationship with him. But there's also times where God will allow something to come into your life as a means of chastisement or correction. If there's a big burden that's come in your life. There's a, a problem with your health, a problem with your finances. It is possible that that is the judgment of God. And if it's a judgment of God, I want to tell you, be thankful for the correction. Be thankful that God loves you enough to chastise you and correct you and, and do whatever's necessary to bring you back to him. And, and if that is you tonight and you're facing the chastisement of God, recognize it as what it is and do something about it. You know, we see the problem of sin and the judgment forward. And then, and then as we go on here, and beginning where we read in our text, we see an exhortation from the Lord. The Israelites were going through this experience of the judgment of God, but even though they had this experience, there was still hope for them. God is, is reaching out to them one more time to address their condition and call them back to him. And first thing we see there in verse 12 is we see a call for repentance. Look there at verse 12. Therefore also now saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garments, and turn the Lord your God. There's a message from the Lord for them that repentance was the only hope they had for restoration. And he, first of all, there in verse 12, tells them to turn their heart. God called them to turn with all their heart, not just stop what they were doing, not just move away from their doing, but completely turn away from what they're doing towards God and the things of God. To turn completely back to God. There's not many things that I dislike in this world more than walking through a spider web. They'll catch you by surprise, it'll uh, it'll test your testimony sometimes in front of certain people. I can't stand walk, walking by when I can't stand seeing them in the house. And my, my wife, she feels even more adamantly about that. And if, if there's ever spiders on the, on the porch or spiders in a specific place or even walking through the woods and see them, we'll do whatever we can to, to knock them down or to clean them up. And many times at the house, if, if we haven't sprayed or treated as we should, our porch is a, 
uh, a, a breeding ground for spiders. And we'll go out there and we can, we can get the broom, we can clean it all up and we go out the next day and every single web that used to be there is back. And then it's on. Either get, that, get out the spray and I'll spray the house trying to get them out of there or I will look for the spider. And when we see it, we kill it. Or we hope that the spray that we sprayed has, has gotten them out of there or killed them. If I never would kill the spider, the webs would continue to come back. I could clean it up a little bit. I could make it nicer. It could appear nicer to the eye. I wouldn't maybe walk through them for a, for a certain amount of time, but eventually it's back. There's so many times in our life that we recognize sin that is there and we do what we can to clean it up or to avoid it for some, for some time, but I want to encourage you tonight, kill the spider. There may be a temptation in your life, something that God, that the devil keeps bringing back, these cobwebs of sin, and we will truly, we will never get rid of the temptation until we repent and turn from whatever it is and avoid it at all cost. Don't, don't allow yourself to continue to fall prey to whatever stronghold it is that the devil continues to bring into your life. And there may be someone here tonight that is struggling uh, with certain sites they may continue to go across. Or whenever a certain app is on your phone, you spend so much of your time on it. Or there's things that are on there that you shouldn't be seeing or, or participating in. Get rid of it. Don't allow that temptation to be there. Maybe there's someone here tonight that struggles with the thought of alcohol, the temptation that is there, or some other addiction. Don't put yourself in a position to be tempted by those things. Don't go places where those temptations are. Don't, don't surround yourself with people that are participating in those things. There may be somebody tonight that struggles with their, their thought life or their, their attitude or the way they, they, they think about the things of this world or uh, certain lusts that are in their heart and mind. Get rid of the music that keeps tempting you. Stop watching programs or, or movies, TV shows, uh, YouTube videos, whatever it is that might tempt you. Get rid of the spider. Completely turn from whatever it is. Truly repent. Seek accountability. Seek help. And the Lord's message to them, his, his, his exhortation to them was, first of all, to repent. To turn. And then in verse 2, he continues on and he says, And rend your heart and not your garment." We understand with any knowledge of the word of God that the rending of garments was a very popular thing for people to do when they would mourn or when they had let God down or when they were trying to seek fellowship with him. And it was something that outwardly showed how sorry they were. And Joel is telling them here, don't just give an outward appearance of repentance. Don't just rend your clothes, rend your heart. Your heart should be broken for the things that you've participated in or where you've allowed it to go. Your heart should be broken because you, you haven't used it to love God as you should or, or follow your God as you should. Truly understand in your heart what you've done. There should be a change of heart. There should be a conviction there. There should be sorrow in your heart for what you've done. You know, God isn't just looking for external displays of religion. He's looking for a people broken over their sin who are willing to change. He's looking for people who are sorrowful over their sin and, 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 and show it by fasting, weeping, mourning in their heart for the actions and the wrongs they've done. I wanted them to rend their heart. As a teenager, we, we moved out from a parsonage of the church my dad pastored, and we moved out to Hillsboro, Missouri, just about 15 minutes from where our church was. And we had about... Two and a half acres sit there in the middle of the woods on a gravel road, Hickory Lane, if you want to look it up. I don't think you really would. But. I remember mowing the, the yard there, and the yard was basically a big hill, had a lot of trees in it. We had our old riding lawnmower, and it was my job once a week to, to mow the grass and to weed eat everything out there, and I would do that. And uh, as, as we would go down this hill, we'd have to turn around these trees and sometimes almost tip over, but one of these times in particular... I turned and the mower didn't turn with me. The axle just snapped. My dad and I got the mower and we loaded it up into our pickup truck and, and took it over to Brother David Dix's house. 
He was a welder. Remember, we took it over there, and he got it out, and he began to, to weld on it. And after several minutes, it was fixed. And I remember telling him, a uh, 15 or 16-year-old boy, I said, I'll be more careful next time. I, I, when I turn on a hill, I won't do it as hard, or I'll try to figure out a way to, to take less pressure off. And he looked at me, and he said, son, that thing's stronger than it ever was. That weld is strong. It's stronger than it was before. Isn't that exactly what... God does with our lives and our hearts as well. The book of Proverbs says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. You know, God loves a broken heart because he knows when we come to him in that condition, he can make, first of all, all things new. He can give us a new heart and a new spirit. And with the problems we face in our lives, the things God has helped us deliver from, we can be better and stronger than we were before. Genuine repentance is the only hope we have to see true revival, true restoration in our life when we're separated from God. There's a call for repentance, and there's also an exhortation for restoration. Beginning there in verse 15, we've already read it. God calls on all the people from the oldest to the youngest, to come back to him. He's, he's looking, he's calling for those who were consumed with the matters of life more than him to put him first again. He's calling on all the spiritual leaders there in their day to come back to him. And God is calling on his people to seek his face again. He wants them to be hungry for him again. He's calling his people back to this place of closeness and holiness. There in verse 16, he says, gather the people, sanctify the congregation. He goes, separate, to uh, be holy, consecrate, dedicate the congregation. He's calling his people to separate from the wickedness of this world to him alone, to, to be separate from the sins, from the temptations, from the, from the concerns of this world to where he is all that matters. It's calling for true restoration of their heart. When I look at our, our five kids, they are all very much different from each other. All of them get in trouble. Some of them more than others. You know who you are? Okay. <laughs> but they all get in trouble. <clears throat> You know, we, we go through the same things. Whenever one has done something wrong, we'll, we'll talk to them about it. We'll sit down. They'll be punished. Some of them are broken immediately. Some of them it takes a little bit. Some of them it takes a couple hours on the couch discussing the problem until they finally admit that they've done wrong. But after a while, and after the punishment has, has taken place, it always ends with whatever child that was coming back to me or their mom. Many times when one of the girls will do something wrong and be in trouble, they'll be sent upstairs, and after, after a while they'll come down with tears in their eyes and they'll look at, at me and say, I'm sorry, Daddy, and they'll get a hug or they'll look to their mom and, and, and say the same thing. When that happens, they come, they come into my arms and their relationship that we had before is restored just like it was. There may be people here tonight that have faced chastisement, that have been punished. You feel that break in, the, in your fellowship with, with God. I want to I encourage you, come home to him. And look at the story of the prodigal son, and we understand that his father gave him his portion of the inheritance, and he went out and he spent it in riotous living. And after he realized all he'd done, after he was there uh, eating with the pigs, he, he, he came back. And what did his father do? He made a meal. He gave him his ring. He restored fellowship. I encourage you, if you've, if you've done wrong against the Lord, understand what you've done, and as you repent, seek true restoration with him. Realize that he's to be, he needs to be your first priority of life. Come to a place in your life where he, nothing matters but his will. This message was to repent and seek restoration. 
He's exhorting them to, to come back to him. And I, I love as we get to verse 18, after we've been given this message of repentance and restoration, we see a promise from God. If they go back to God after truly repenting, they will experience his blessings again. And if anyone hears fellowship has, been, has bro- been broken with the Lord, if we go back to God as he's asked us to go back to him, you are promised to have these three things in your life. And the first one is restoration. If we seek restoration, we will have restoration. God promises to deliver them from their enemies. He promises to feed them and, and bless them and satisfy them. One more time, look there at verse 18. Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and, and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and the oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith, and I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. There's not a, a safe person in the auditorium tonight that doesn't want the blessings of God. Every, every one of us, I believe, truly want the blessings of God. and We want his protection. We want him to deliver us from our enemies. We want him to feed us and to bless us again. We want all of those things. Every true child of God has a burden to see God move in their life and in the life of others. Look at verse 23. It says, Be glad then, you children of, the, of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause, you to, cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. He promises for the, the rains that they had missed to, to come back. The former rain fell in October, November. It would replenish the soil in preparation for the next planting season. The latter rain fell in March and April, and it was there to ensure the harvest was one that was bountiful. And God has promised not only to give them these certain things back, but to bring the rains back so growth can happen, so their blessings can come. To erase the days of drought and devastation, he's promising true revival of his blessings on the land. And that is just what we need. We need the Lord to open up the clouds and erase a, a spiritual drought that may be in, in our life when we have been separated from him. And God has promised us if we repent, he will restore all the things we've missed and bring blessings back to our life. We need God to give us back those things the enemies tried to take away from us. Whenever we've been separated from the Lord and that fellowship isn't where it needs to be and the blessings haven't been there as we need to be, think about all the things that the devil has either successfully taken away or tried to take away. If we're not in a place with the Lord where we need to be, I can tell you, first of all, the fruits of the Spirit are not going to be there. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Those wouldn't be there. Wisdom, true wisdom that only comes from God. Wisdom in the trials you face or in the temptations of this world. Faith in him, confidence in him. The Bible says, if if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. What about all those answers to prayer that you've been missing? He says, if you restore this fellowship with me, if you truly repent of what you've done, I, I will restore to you all the blessings that you've been missing out on. All the good things of the Christian life can come back if true restoration has happened. What a promise. There's a promise of of restoration returning, and there's also a promise of a life of praise. Look at verse 26. I like this one a lot. And ye shall eat in plenty... And be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. God's people, as they experience the blessings of the, uh, of the restoration, will experience those blessings and be satisfied by them. And then they'll praise him. 
They'll, they'll worship him and exalt him. They'll hold their heads high before their enemies. They'll no longer be an object of shame, but they'll be blessed and they'll rejoice because of the restored condition. You know, we have many reasons to praise. C.S. Lewis, on the thought of praise, he said, I think we delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses but completes the enjoyment. The delight is incomplete till it is expressed. You think of two people that have fallen in love. And those two people begin to fall in love. They begin to feel all of these feelings they've never felt before. And they feel this love in their heart that is just overwhelming for that person that they've, they've come to love in their life. And that, that love, that, that, that joy is not complete until they express it to the other one. They'll continue to, to write letters of love or they'll, they'll send text or they'll, they'll say, I love you, no, I love you, no, I love you. They'll continue to, to pass these things back and forth. Why? Because the true enjoyment is, is not there until they fulfill, until they express the enjoyment. Think about a really good meal. When you're eating a really good meal, you usually will look to someone there at the table and say, this is good. Compliments to the chef. You want to tell whoever cooked the meal how, how delicious it was. You want to talk to somebody you're experiencing it with, how much you've enjoyed it. A lot of people have told me this past week that Ruby's been telling people she really likes Bald Daddy because he makes good mac and cheese. <laughs> Delight is incomplete until expressed. Sports fans. When people are at a sporting event, they'll see something amazing happen, and, and what do they do? They look to the person next to them and high five, or they shout out. If they're watching it at home, you'll send a text to somebody, or you'll, you'll call somebody on the phone, or you'll look to the person you're watching it with and say, did you see that? That is amazing. Delight is incomplete until expressed. As we enjoy the blessings and satisfaction of God, you will not be able to help but sing his praises. Do you miss that? Do, do you want that in your life? It comes as we experience his true blessings. I love the song our, our choir sings, How Can I Keep From Singing Your Praise? How can I ever say enough how amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting your name, I know I am loved by the king, and it makes my heart want to sing. When you are truly experiencing the love, the blessings, the relationship, and all the benefits from it of God, praise will come. As true restoration comes, there's a promise that effortless praise will follow. It's a promise of restoration, a promise of praise, and the last thing tonight, a promise of confidence. Verse 27, and ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. As these things happen, as my blessings pour down, as those rains are pouring, as the fruits are coming back, as the pastures are there and the, the animals are there, as, as you're experiencing th these things and praising my name, there will be evidence of me in your life. They will know and they will truly believe. They will have confidence in the fact that God is in their midst and he alone is the source of their strength, the power, and, and everything behind their blessings. They will set their hearts to follow him and they won't be drawn back to where they'd come from. Confidence not in themselves, but in the one who's provided all the blessings they have. Do you want that confidence? I remember seven, eight years old, my very first roller coaster, we went to Six Flags Atlanta, and my, my mom and dad and my sisters, we were all there, and my two older sisters and my dad were really trying to get me to ride my first real roller coaster. The Ninja. It looked like it had a million upside-down loops on it. I still remember the intimidation there the first time I saw it. They kept telling me, buddy, it's, it's safe and it's fun. Look at all these people. All these people are coming off. And I got in line with them the beginning of that day, and they're dragging me through there, and we get to the line. They got on. I walked away with my mom. 
They get off and they go, that was so much fun. It, it was safe and it's fun. You got to do it. And we went throughout the day and we did other things. And finally, at the end of the day, they took me back. Buddy, it's safe and it's fun. I didn't believe it. Got through the line and we get there and I, I got the courage up to, to get on that roller coaster. And you know what? It was safe and it was fun. They told me over and over again. But it wasn't until I wrote it for myself that I knew. I'd heard of the safety and they told me it was safe. They told me it was fun. But it wasn't until I experienced it for myself that I had true faith in that statement. You may have knowledge of God's power tonight. You may have knowledge of his benefits, but when you finally experience it for yourself, you can have true confidence in who he is. Maybe going through a trial, different struggles. Maybe struggling just getting the courage to be the witness that God would have you to be, or there may be some uncertainty in your life. When God delivers and gives you the strength you need and when you, and you, when you put your faith in him as every blessing comes as every bit of help comes from him your confidence will only grow he promised them you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel I am the Lord your God and none else absolute confidence in me because of what I'm going to do in your life Restoration is possible. And nobody here is too far gone in their walk with the Lord to find it. Romans chapter 13, and we're done. We're going to see the revival we need. Many have to change their ways. Many have to maybe just step up a little bit. Get back to the Lord. Get away from complacency. You know, Paul's advice to the church of Rome still works for us today. Look there at verse 11. And that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Turn away, get all those things out of your life and put on Jesus. In 2006, a book was released called The Blind Side. A couple years later, a movie came out. I'm, I'm sure many people in here have know the story. It's a story, a true story about the Tui family that was riding down the road one day. They met this, this young man and their lives were changed forever. And as they tell the story, they say that it came down to two words. They were driving one morning, and it was cold November, and they, they see this young man walking in this, on this cold, wet day in a T-shirt and shorts. And after they drove past Leanne too, he looked at her husband and said, turn around. They turned around, and they invited this young man to their car, and they ended up eventually adopting him. He got a good education. He had a good family and eventually became a first-round pick for the Baltimore Ravens. But they say those two words changed their lives forever. The words turn around can change anyone's life. When we decide to turn, we change direction and begin a new exciting journey in the Lord. Possibly turning from disbelief to faith. Possibly turning from uh, sin to righteous living. Turning from a faithless life to one that 
is, an, is a life of trust and prayer in God and who he is and what he can do. A life from bitterness to, to joy and contentment. But the reverse in your life, the restoration in your life, the revival in your heart will not happen unless you decide to turn around. No matter what state your relationship with God is in tonight, the Lord can do great things in your life, and he wants to. Restoration is possible. But we just need to turn around and seek God. Every head bowed, every eye closed. The altar's open. Maybe there's someone in here tonight that's under the chastisement of God. Maybe there's someone in here tonight that really just feels separated from the Lord. Things aren't as good as they once were. If that's the case, turn towards God. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this clear truth we found here in the book of Joel tonight. And I pray that you bless this time of invitation. Yes, he sings in your name. Amen. As Brother Jagger sings, the altar's open. Let's all stand together. Search me, O God. Great day it was here in church today. So glad you were here with us and uh, thankful for all the Lord did today. Um, before we're dismissing, I know we have donations there in the back. Any men that are uh, part of that, we'd like to ask them to go back at this time, get that ready. And just want to encourage you to keep praying for Pastor and Mrs. Tidd while they're away. The Lord will bless them with safety and just give them a great uh, time of relaxation and refreshment as they're away. <clears throat> and we want to invite you to be back here in your place uh, Wednesday night at 7 o'clock for church. Looking forward to all that God's going to do there. Uh, as we're dismissed, uh, Brother Lonnie, will you pray for us tonight? about Jesus. Blessing and safety.